thank you all for, for coming and being a part of this. Um, this is the first of our series of events for Earth Week. As an instructor at Cabrillo College, I worked with students and invested a lot of time in making the entire week around Earth Day an opportunity for multiple teach-ins, multiple ways of considering the meaning of Earth Day, of considering what the human relationship is to the rest of our living world. As I've been working and developing the ideas around Nova Sutras over the last several years, it occurs to me that this is one of the most important times to really bring some of those deeper ideas to the fore. So that's um, how I'd like to help us all start Earth Week. Lots of organizations all over the world are doing events and because of the global pandemic, these events are all online. So there's lots of ways to access them. Mostly they're focused around the actual uh, date of Earth Day on the 22nd but I thought it would be useful to start out Earth Week with a real grounding and an opportunity for a deeper internal spiritual reflection on the meaning of Earth Day and being participants in Earth's biosphere. The principles of Nova Sutras really distill down to honoring the earth and honoring all of life. We recognize that nature is very dynamic, very complex, that everywhere we look, we find evidence of cooperation and reciprocal relationships. And everywhere we look, we find incredible beauty. And that in some sense, it's actually a human duty to honor and celebrate that. And it's our responsibility as recipients of all of this bounty of all of this loveliness to protect it, to offer what we can in return. In 1970, humans were just getting started in actually being able to leave this tiny protective bubble of the biosphere and venture farther out. And every human who has had a chance to experience this reports a profound amazement when they look back and recognize how precious our little home world is. That we live in just this thin layer between the mass of molten rocks and metals under us and the inhospitable vacuum of space above us. Recently, scientists have started to talk about this as the critical zone. Everything we know about life is dependent on this very, very tiny patch on the surface of Earth, the oceans, the soils, and up to where the atmosphere thins.
humans are having an amazing and not always good impact on what's going on in that critical zone. We are a spacefaring species and we are also a species whose mark is clearly visible from space. For probably tens of thousands of years, humans have been keystone species in every ecosystem they touch. We modify ecosystems like beavers, like ants. For most of those tens of thousands of years, we've done that in ways that honor the earth, that create conditions conducive to human life, but also supporting a tremendous diversity of other life. And it's only in the last several centuries that that has profoundly unraveled. And the ways that we change ecosystems have become potentially deeply destructive to life. Our incredible intelligence and creativity and capacities have allowed us to see the dynamism, the complexity, the power of nature and to start to understand it and to understand how the choices we make are affecting natural processes everywhere. When humans first got far enough away from the earth that they could see the entire globe, we were transformed as a species. We had a new perspective on what was at stake. And this perspective informed the first Earth Day and has informed our consciousness ever since. Astronauts refer to it as the overview effect. Seeing this small, fragile globe and knowing that everything you care about is within that and depends on it. And that as far as we know, it is unique in all the cosmos. There's no other place like this. We have yet to encounter anywhere remotely similar to Earth in terms of its ability to support the kind of life that, that we know of. This complex biosphere that we have has been described as a living entity in, in and of itself, a super organism called Gaia that maintains her own health through the dynamic interplay of different species, through the interplay of stone and soil, water and air, all fueled by energy coming in from the sun. To an individual human, it is vast and incredibly powerful. But with just a little distance, it is tiny and incredibly fragile. In Nova Sutras, we talk about this superorganism, Gaia, and the ways that we express 
and honor it using this term agaya, a combination of that, that word gaia and the Greek term agape, which means a vast transcendent universal love. We also focus on a concept called Ubuntu. This is a word from Southern Africa that speaks about community, reciprocity, and interdependence. So Agaya expresses both the unbelievable beauty and complexity and wonder that we find wherever we look in nature. And also our internal resonance to that beauty. The awe, delight, and reverence that we feel when we recognize that we are part of this incredible dance this incredible creativity of life in the universe. We take time to celebrate Ubuntu as one aspect of a Gaia because it's so important for us as humans to remember. Like just a handful of other species, Humans are incredibly dependent on our reciprocal relationships to one another. In addition to all of these relationships of generosity and reciprocity that we find all over the living world. Each of our lives relies on the oxygen produced by photosynthesizers, phytoplankton in the oceans, trees and grasses and other plants on land. We couldn't survive without these. Every breath we take is a celebration of Ubuntu. Plants do something amazing that we cannot do. They capture the energy from the sun and they turn it into substance, combining water and carbon dioxide, minerals, creating the structures of their own bodies, which then go to nourish other beings Animals are utterly incapable of surviving without a reciprocal relationship with plants. As humans, we depend on the organisms in the soil that keep plants healthy and vital, that help them communicate with one another. We depend on the pollinators that help plants to reproduce to set fruit. And plants, plants are creating fruits and flowers to attract the animal cooperators that they want. All of this great beauty, wonderful aromas, delicious flavors, these are gifts of plants to keep our relationship going to remind us to be good partners, to participate in this wonderful celebration of interdependence and Ubuntu. So now to really open this as sacred space, we're going to call the corners and we're going to send out wishes that all beings 
abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. That all beings experience wonder and joy and beauty. That all beings participate in reciprocity, generosity, and the gift of life. So we'll send that out in six directions. And then we'll send that out in radiating circles from where each of us is right now. If you're comfortable with it, you can say this along with me. And um, particularly, you'll get the rhythm of this ending phrase as we describe where we're sending this. Um, that all beings abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. It's nearing midday where I am, so I'll begin where the sun is in the south. May all beings to the south abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings to the West abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings to the North abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings to the East abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings above abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings below abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all the great tree beings connecting above and below abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. And like them, may I help connect heaven and earth and abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings nearby abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings in this watershed abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings in this bioregion abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings on this continent abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all the beings in Earth's vast, deep oceans abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all the beings on Earth's sunlit hemisphere abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. May all beings in the dark of Earth's night abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. And may all beings everywhere in Earth's beautiful, bountiful, beneficent biosphere abide in a Gaia and Ubuntu. Now I invite you to really settle in, to feel yourself as part of Earth's biosphere, to feel those connections of Ubuntu that link you to all living things, to feel the way our planet draws you in holds you with an embrace, 
supports you, supports your feet as you walk, supports the weight of your body as you rest. Allow the earth to receive that weight now. Really settle in. Really feel that pull of gravity as a kind of love that the earth has for all her creatures. Allow your shoulders to drop. Allow your neck to lengthen. Feel your spine become long and straight. And feel the way that you are connecting the soil below and the sky above. Feel yourself as an ally to the trees whose whole life is dedicated to making this great connection between sky and soil, between heaven and earth. Allow yourself to feel rooted. Allow yourself to grow tall and strong. Allow yourself to feel the generosity of the sun providing energy for all of this incredible life. As you breathe in deeply, Try to feel how the energy from the sun has been captured by plants and stored both as sugars that become food and as this high energy oxygen molecule that allows us to process that food. Take in this sweet oxygen, so rare in the cosmos, so essential to us as Earth's animals. The presence of so much oxygen on Earth is one of the clear signals that this is a living planet. It's only possible in this dynamic action of photosynthesizers. It's what makes human life possible. What makes the hummingbirds and the bees possible. What makes snails and whales possible. This is Gaia in action, nourishing us with deep breaths. And as we take in these gifts from the plant world, we exhale carbon dioxide the very thing that they need to keep growing. So as we exhale, give gratitude to all of the plants and phytoplankton, trying to take in all of the carbon that humans and other organisms release, doing their best to keep it moving, keep it in this dynamic flow of life on Earth. These are our friends and allies, and they are working so hard for us. A 
what can we do but offer our thanks as we exhale? as we participate in this cycle, this wonderful reciprocal dance of generosity in life. So as we move towards the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day, let's start from a place of gratitude for our beautiful, fragile home world. For all the teeming life on that tiny blue sphere in space. Breathe in the wonder and joy and beauty of a Gaia. Breathe out the gratitude and connection and interdependence of Ubuntu. Inhale, Agaya. Exhale, Ubuntu. Inhale, Agaya. Exhale, Ubuntu. Inhale, Agaya. Exhale, Ubuntu. Now, begin to inhale Ubuntu. Feel all the gifts of nature coming into you with every breath. And then exhale a Gaia to spread wonder and joy along all those lines of interconnection. Inhale Ubuntu and exhale a Gaia. Inhale, Ubuntu. And exhale, Agaya. Inhale, Ubuntu. And exhale, Agaya. Inhale, Ubuntu. Exhale, Agaya.
Now I invite you to really share these gifts of Agaya and Ubuntu and offer them out to all beings all around Earth to feel your connection to all the life on this planet and to share your gratitude and love as gifts of Ubuntu and Agaya. Allow Ubuntu and Agaya to radiate from your heart center out to touch all beings. Together, we are offering these gifts of Ubuntu and Agaya to the world. Together, we are shining the light of Ubuntu and Agaya across the universe from our small, fragile, beautiful little home world. Sparkling and resplendent with Ubuntu and Agaya. A few more deep, delicious breaths. Savoring this connection of Ubuntu and Agaya with all beings. And then gently start to reconnect with your own body. with the way the earth holds and embraces you. With the way the plants nourish you. With the way all your friends, all of the people you love and all of the people who love you. Share in your joy. Share in this wonderful dance of reciprocity. Share in this great community of Ubuntu. And how special it is to have a chance to touch in with the awe and reverence and deep joy of a Gaia. Start to move your body a little, maybe wiggle your fingers and toes, stretch and shift your arms and legs. Roll your shoulders, stretch your neck, and then very, very gently open your eyes and come back to the place you are, knowing that you're always surrounded by Ubuntu and Agaya.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you, that was great. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for being here and for being part of this. I can really feel it. <laughs> Is there anything anyone wants to share about what came up for them during this meditation? Well, I think I was feeling this one a little more then maybe I have other times. It always is good. It's always very helpful. Um, also, I kept uh, thinking about some of those images before we went into the meditation. I, those are beautiful. I mean, that one of the biosphere, is, uh, it reminded me Earth Days, the year after we landed on the moon, which is how a lot of people first saw Remember that image was all over the place, uh, and it really does. It well, really does change your perspective about what's going on, who we are. One of the uh, one of the other events um, that happens in April that I've always felt is is uh, an interesting partner to Earth Day is. 10 days before that, April 12th, is uh, Yuri's night. It's the night that the first human orbited the planet. Oh, April 12th. Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I, huh. I don't, don't know if there was any deliberateness to that, but it just it feels like a really important recognition. You know, it's not... In, in some sense, it's, it's not a coincidence that this resonance of humans leaving the planet and humans really understanding the planet and then humans finally gathering together to say, it's our yeah. responsibility to take yeah. care of this planet. Yeah. That's, that's not coincidental. There's an important message. Mm. Yeah, there's something kind of wonderful about that because on the one hand, I think space exploration, I find the whole fixation on Mars particularly challenging to identify with. But I think a lot of it is, for some people at least, about escaping the Earth. Yeah as if that would be liberating um, but i love it that when they took that first um, earthrise photo that the immediate effect was to help people be here yeah. Yeah. be here in a mindful way to sort of be here knowing what here means yeah. um, so that seems like I don't know, the universe being kind. Yeah, it's, um, somehow I see it as, okay, we've got one more chance. You can get this right. Just look at what you're doing. Um, you know, that there's, there's an important message to that. Yep. And uh, yeah, and of course, one of the things that we learned right away is that um, places like Mars are much less conducive to life right. than this planet. And, um, you know, if you think a month or two of social isolation and staying in your home on Earth is bad, imagine what a couple of years on Mars would be like you would have to live in a very sheltered box. That's all you've got. Nobody wants that. <laughs> oh, um, 
Benny here, you're muted. Oh, I just, that's such a resonant and powerful and timely point to make. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's really like hits home right now. Yeah. One of the things that came up for me was that um, in the meditation on a guy and Ubuntu, I, it was always most poignant for me to start, to continue the practice of starting with, 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 the, with the Ubuntu visualization beginning right where I am. Um, and it mm. kind of spreading out um, mm. the interconnected network of life spreading out from the locality here, the ecosystem here that I'm familiar with. Um, and that has so much, I think that has a lot of resonant meaning in how we approach our giving whatever that might be, like the giving back in our relationship with the biosphere is most felt um, or at least most easily grounded and informed um, right where we are, where we're most familiar. That was kind of like a, a thought that arose out of out of my the, the practice of visualizing Ubuntu that that came today to me. Yeah, one of the one of the practices, well, a lot of the practices that Nova Sutras encourages, but um, in particular, as we do the calling the corners, when you you know our sending out these wishes for uh, Agaya and Ubuntu to all beings in your bioregion to really think about what that is, to think about the beings that you know. Uh, yeah, here in the Santa Cruz area, you know, we're talking about redwoods and banana slugs and Anna's hummingbirds and um, I wish I knew the dragonflies better. <laughs> Um, you know, and the, oh, the marine life and the, the city shearwaters and just all of these things that, that we get to see maybe not every day, but often enough that they feel like home. Mm. And that's true anywhere in the world. There's always so much beauty if you just have a moment to go look for it. Um, a little harder in settings that have been very, very human influenced, and yet it's still there. And it's still there even in, especially in other humans. We find each other incredibly beautiful mm. because we are. We're amazing animals. We are no less amazing than a sea otter or a monarch butterfly or a redwood tree. So everywhere you are, you can connect with natural beauty. It's always there. You know, there, there are places and times where we try not, probably not entirely deliberately, but where what humans have done squelches almost all of it and it still shows up it still shows up Every yeah time. okay so does anyone have have other things they want to want to talk about um i think one of the questions that was offered is um how does this inform your 
response to the idea of Earth Day, a day where we're celebrating the whole planet? Honestly, I think we have to up our game. <laughs> and really, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of the time, the first Earth Day, which I was in Santa Cruz first, really, to live here in 1973. And this Santa Cruz is different than that Santa Cruz, even though there are trees, there are redwoods, there's sky, there's sea, it's still beautiful. I think somebody more recently, that would just be obvious. To me, for me, my particular way of filtering through things seems to always be through the thick, difficult part. So maybe it's just my psychology, but uh, uh, I still think it's a beautiful place. It would really be nicer with a lot fewer cars. <laughs> People a lot more relaxed. And it's, when, you, when I speak like this or when anyone does, you know, I am of course missing uh, just the natural movement that people normally would have in this town. Uh, I mean, I understand why that isn't the case and that's good. I'm, I'm in favor of it, but it's, uh, <clears throat> I have a lot, I guess this is a good time to think about what you really want when people are back out and around and uh, in a more familiar manner, but uh, Yeah, I was going to say the um, those original Earth Days. Remember Stuart? Did anyone remember Stuart Brand? The whole Earth. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was, before there was a drawdown, there was another big encyclopedia book that I. It's not so much. I would skim through the book or read parts of it and stuff, and I kind of forget about it. But it was such an iconic thing for many years, mm -hmm. and that just kind of gradually became it ran its cycle i guess mm -hmm. uh, the people who were doing it uh, and thinking of something like that being a little more vibrant and continual might have been it's this it's like the road we didn't take so uh, and the road is full of roadblocks from people with specific interest i made the mistake of reading about one of them last night before i was trying to sleep and I wasn't able to sleep at all. It was awful. But uh, and just by contrast, it, it makes it makes the natural world that much more beautiful because I know darn well there are people just absolutely taking it for granted, just using it. I was thinking about. Um, do you know about Sikkim in Egypt? It is a um, incredibly lush. Uh, area that was complete desert um, and hmm. some combination of the kind of ecosystem restoration that Lou does and permaculture uh, created I mean it looks when you look at it it looks like the tropics <laughs> you know, and it's it's completely surrounded by desert so uh, it's pretty Im impressive and then last night I don't know why this hasn't occurred to me before, but um, Nightingale asked me if I had any direct experience with indigenous um, ecological knowledge. And I said, well, a little, because my dad grew up on the Big Island and he was adopted by Native Hawaiians um, and absorbed all this knowledge um, of history myth, but also a, a ton about um, the flora and fauna of the islands. And, um, he loved to show off. He was able to make things that uh, really only grow in the islands, grow in Stockton, California, which is a, a desert, you know, it's just dry and hot. Um, so it shouldn't have worked at all. But um, I don't know. I have this, I mean, I just would love it if somehow we could have some governments start to think more freely about large scale ecosystem restoration. And if we could, yeah. you know, invite yeah. people, if we could have like a global yeah. conservation corps. 
mm-hmm. or anyone who wanted it, mm-hmm. for their life to be about giving life back to the source of life. To do that work, because um, I got to say, spending, I think I only really spend about 45 minutes or an hour with the ecosystem restoration people, but they're just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Be really wonderful people. You can see it is uh, very good for them. Yeah, what they're doing as well as good for the earth. So. Well, I um, I have to say that you know one of the one of the founding visions of Nova Sutras was to be a place that could really support that kind of work. That, um, that even before I started to hear about John Linus' work, the whole idea of doing ecosystem restoration work in yeah. general, um, just from the, the little bit that I knew about sort of wetlands restoration and, and some other um, approaches like that and, and reforestation in the tropics. Um, but the potential is so vast yeah. and uh, and the potential in terms of using ecosystems thinking to transform um, agricultural land to really make that into ecologically rich yeah. habitat rather than giant monoculture um, oh. that all of that has so much potential in terms of stabilizing climate, in terms of restoring biodiversity. Bringing back the pollinators, the yeah. Yeah. is terrible for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and this is a project that, just like planting a tree, would have been great if we had started 20 years ago. Um, but since we didn't do that, shouldn't we start today? Yeah. Um, and so trying to trying to feel into how do we build global movements that that can genuinely support all of that. And obviously John Moon is doing a, a just amazing job with the, the ecosystem restoration camps. I had some contact with those folks um, last year and, and they're it's it's incredible work. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the most exciting things that's come out of this whole period, the idea of <clears throat> restoring the earth. I, when you know, We were going down to see uh, Paul's late brother in Cayucas, and we'd go through the Central Valley. So, of course, we'd see miles and miles, acres and acres in every direction of crops. Mm-hmm. And I, I kept trying to picture what it would be like to have, like silva pasturing or re- reforestation that somehow intermixed with this, that so you had a whole whole different style of, of growing and uh, that I couldn't help but think would help restore the water better than it is now instead of having to pipe it everywhere and and what a different place it would be. What a much more livable place, in fact, for the people who labor there it could be just on, yeah. on that basis alone. But uh, certainly a positive. It's a, I wish I'd been involved in this uh, what Lou's doing years and years ago when I, you know, <laughs> had a little more moxie and energy and my back was in better shape, but uh, I'm still fascinated by it. That's a very exciting thing. I think that that's a thing that people could really get excited about in the world, a lot of people. Right, and, and greening cities. You know? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah, again, that, um, Bob, one, what you said about the, when you look at these big croplands yeah. and you oh. think about how depressing working in yeah, that well, yeah. <laughs> system is yeah. and how many people love to play in their garden. Yeah, yeah. And the difference is the diversity. Yeah. You know, when you're, when you're working in your garden, you're not looking at acres and acres and acres of the yeah. same thing and fighting all the same pests. No, yeah. you're looking at individual plants doing different things in different places. Um, and again, we have so much knowledge that we've gained in the last 50 years 
uh, from a scientific perspective. And if we can combine that then with tapping into the traditional ecological knowledge of the remaining indigenous cultures, um, everywhere could be beautiful gardens. Yes. It's, it's what yeah. humans are made to do. Yeah. We're so good at it. So. And it would mean breaking up a lot of the big, big conglomerates that run yeah. these things to more localized, real people just working uh, the land uh, type of thing. It's, there's a lot of actual labor that still needs to be done in the world. And it would be yeah. better to have it more fairly uh, divided up, uh, I think, with a lot of people be very willing to think they're taking part in restoring the earth. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, so it all comes down to these cultural constructs we've made about what is valuable and yeah. how you, how you get the means to have food and shelter. Um, and yeah. the system that we have in place yeah. encourages all the wrong things. Yeah. It really does. Um, and, and it's, when you look at its history, it's, it's almost unsurprising. It, you know, this is a, a model that essentially comes out of uh, slavery and serfdom as a model. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, so. it's got most of those same ingredients baked into it. Um, so we, it's going to require a really big rethink. But it's all, it's all cultural decisions. It's not the natural order and it's not the only way humans can live. We see this right. everywhere we look um, where humans have, are, you know, still able to continue to live somewhat as they did uh, before these big imperial systems came to impose this, this structure of um, mass production. I know. Um, and it's, you know, and, and again, it's, it's a lot of it's tied in with human happiness. This is not what makes us happy. Yeah. At all. Um, quite the opposite. Okay. Well, um, is there more that we want to talk about or should we start to wrap this up? Well, it's always nice to have your company. But yeah. Yeah, likewise. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Oh, nice. thank you. Really, I'm really glad you made the time for it. And um, me too. Yeah, and we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Okay, Michelle. Take care. Right. Take care. Take care. Yeah. As we move toward Earth Day, we want to hold in our hearts that nature is sacred. That dynamic change is essential, inevitable, and important. It is a key characteristic of life itself. That everywhere we look, complexity and maturity are emerging from diverse, cooperative, generous relationships. And that it's this very cooperation that leads to the great beauty in the living world that we should be savoring, honoring, celebrating, and above all, protecting. We have a series of events planned for the rest of Earth Week. Um, we have an event tomorrow afternoon to talk about our discussion series and other events and how to make them um, more community-based. Be offering a guided meditation for the new moon the day after Earth Day, April 23rd in the evening. And then Paul will be offering a historical look at Earth Day and the uh, politics from 50 years ago through the present called Reclaiming Hope, Earth Day Comes Back Home. Uh, you can go to novasutras.org slash events to find out more and register for these. 
one of the things that Nova Sutras always offers is the octal meditations. They're similar to what we did today. The next octal meditation will be the cross quarter on May 4th, local time. And we're asking for help growing Nova Sutras events. You can support our work through Patreon or a one-time donation on PayPal. Uh, and more than that, you can help out. You can become part of the co-creative community of Nova Sutras. And you can sign up on novasutras.org slash uplifters to learn more about that. And of course, there's lots of material to see uh, on the website and on our social media to learn more about what we're doing and ways that we can um, better share Ubuntu and Agaya. Thank you and have a happy and beautiful Earth Week. Thank mm -hmm. you.